Thank you very much, Gabby. We are moving now to the last lecture by Professor Jürgen Wren, who is the director of the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin. Professor Wren is honorary professor for history of science at both Humboldt Univers University at Berlin and the Freie University at Berlin. He has taught at Boston University at the ETH Zurich and at the University of Tel Aviv. He has held visiting positions in Vienna, Bergamo, Pavia, and Caltech. He is a member of the Leopoldina as well as of the further national and international scientific and editorial boards. He won numerous awards, including the Premio uh, Anasilaus International, <laughs> international <laughs> Award, the <laughs> ESHS. Noyen <laughs> Prize and the Francis Bacon Award. Professor Wren has been engaged from the very start in the digital humanities and the open access movement. He's a co-initiator of the Berlin Declaration on Open Access to Knowledge in the Science and Humanities and has created together with his colleagues the edition Open Access is an innovative book series. He has also been responsible for numerous major or exhibitions on the history of science, from Albert Einstein, chief engineer of the universe, to Archimedes, Arte Scienza, the in uh, Invenzione. Please, Professor thank, thank you, Rivka, very much. I was glad that you had such a lengthy introduction that gave me a chance to set up the, the computer. I won't discuss it in detail, but I, I, thank you very much. So this for me also is a, a moving moment because being in this room, discussing about and with Yehuda, Yehuda was a close personal friend, is somewhat of an eerie feeling. My talk will be dedicated to him. I take issue with him. We were close friends. We had open discussions. And I want to remind you, and these are the parts of my talk, of his vision of a curriculum reform connected to what he called a new enlightenment. I will talk a little bit about our experience, our common experiences of in implementing this vision, and also about the difficulties and some of the fundamental questions and even criticism that have emerged from this experience. And then I will try to respond, to answer to some of these questions again on the background of an experience that I shared with two other colleagues that are here in the room, uh, Bernd Scherer and Christoph Rosol from the Haus der Kulturen der Welt in Berlin. But I'll come, I'll come to that. Yehuda's key argument for a curriculum reform rests on the need for new kinds of knowledge that are required to master the challenges of the world in which we live. He emphasized its messiness and the gap between the models and methods on which the traditional disciplinary organization of knowledge is based and the complexity and context dependency of real world situations. He saw, however, no alternative to maintaining this traditional disciplinary organization as the basis for higher education, but he wanted to complement it by, enhance, by an enhanced education reflecting on knowledge and in how it actually operates in reality. Such a training in, as he called it, higher order knowledge, in which also the philosophy, the history, and the sociology of science would find their places, would hopefully protect its recipients against the naivete of the belief that the simplified models and methods of the disciplines actually correspond to the structure of reality in a globalized world, or that reality can be somehow forced into these schemes. As I said, in light of this, some of the experiences that we have gathered while Yehuda was a guest scholar at the Max Planck Institute for the history, and I might now add, and philosophy of science in, in Berlin, uh, and sociology, of course, uh, talking to uh, many representatives of the universities, university heads in Berlin and, and, and beyond, I see two fundamental problem, and to be short, I will uh, rather drastically I I try to express them. The first problem is sociological and economic in nature. 
and uh, you know, I'm cutting a long story short now, university training is not primarily targeted at educating scientists, scholars, and intellectuals capable of coping with real world problems, but at rep reproducing functional elites for modern societies. For them, education in higher order knowledge may at best represent a complement to functionalist knowledge, itself potentially useful to acquire status-relevant cultural codes. There are certainly niches in the globalized academic world in which reflection is possible and legitimate, fortunately. But where are, and this is my question, within the larger institutional and economic frameworks of education, the strong driving forces pointing to a reform of the curriculum in Yehuda's direction? And I can uh, make reference to Gabi's talk now. Maybe we need a French Revolution, or to be politically correct, a restoration in order to foster uh, such a reform. My experience is simply that within the academic system, there are not enough driving forces to achieve uh, the, uh, the ambitious goals that Yehuda had in mind. A second major problem is epistemological in nature. Yehuda has offered many contributions to the history of science and to the philosophy of science as well in terms of concepts such as body and image of knowledge, of two-tier thinking, of concepts in flux, and many others. And in the reality of knowledge production, the various elements of the architecture of knowledge that he has identified are closely intertwined. As Yehuda has emphasized, for instance, the evolution of images of knowledge co-evolve, is, is a co-evolution with that of the bodies uh, of knowledge. Yet, uh, in this pedagogical scheme that he devised, the two tiers are separately implemented. Uh, bodies of knowledge are taught in more or less traditional disciplinary uh, terms, while contextualizing is done in complementary uh, courses, as he envisaged, and we tried concretely to implement some of these courses in Berlin. But the problem is that such courses would unavoidably represent a negligibly niche of an educational framework. How can contextualizing and reflection under these circumstances appear as anything but as a discretionary add-on, a luxury that will in all but exceptional cases be sacrificed to the economic rationalities of either institutions or personal career planning? And that has been a fate of the philosophy and the history of science in all my experience as a historian of science. The disciplines where they should act and to which they should enter into dialogue have in any cases of uh, uh, lacking affluence, and there's always a situation of lacking affluence, reacted aversely towards the proposal of introducing extra courses. And the students always perceived them only as luxury items that they might do or might not do. I therefore see Yehuda's proposal as a pragmatic concession to a basically resilient institutional framework governed by other forces, rather than as the result of a profound synthesis of the two components of his two-tier th two thinking, the realistic and the relativistic one, in the sense of truly recognizing the historicity and fragility of the scientific enterprise. Yehuda's distinction between the relativist reflection on the history and context of science and the realist appreciation of uh, its results were indeed, from the very beginning, all uh, also a political one. It was a political uh, way of thinking. And the first, uh, to my knowledge, that to clearly state this was Gideon Freudenthal almost 20 years ago. And therefore, I want to quote from uh, what Gideon wrote 20 years ago. He says, I have argued that Yehuda's two-tier two thinking should not be read as a philosophical thesis. I suggested inserting institutional pluralism for relativism while granting the individual scholar his psychological realism. Gideon referred specifically to Yehuda, the institution builder, and I quote again, I reveal no secret in pointing to the fact that Yehuda is a highly active and imaginative founder and administrator of scholarly institutions, and that he implemented institutionalized pluralism in an admirable way and in spite of all the contrary pressures, end of quote. This engagement has had an enormous impact on many of our lives certainly including my own, as Yehuda has been always supportive 
of people with non-mainstream ideas. And Gideon was also right in emphasizing the contrary pressures which make Yehuda's achievements stand out even more. But I doubt that a curriculum reform, as Yehuda envisaged it, will eventually lead us by some incremental process to more pluralistic and reflective academic institutions in which the real world problems will be tackled in more reflective, locally appropriate ways that take into account the cumulative experiences of a history of knowledge in the spirit of what Yehuda called a globalized contextualism. There are certainly niches within the academic system and we have to do all we can in order to preserve and extend these niches in Yehuda's sense. And I understand that this is what many of us here are engaged in. But it would be an illusion to believe that these will be more than niches in a world in which the neoliberal transformation of the state and of many public institutions will spread the logic of markets commercialization, functionalization, and formal competition ever more widely. To be sure, the ways in which this tendency is being implemented is not always evident. They also work more indirectly in terms of the supranational integration of research areas, international benchmarking and agenda setting, the networking of experts, and the committification of science. In his last book, together with Hannes Klöpper, Yehuda expressed himself, of course, critically, very critically with regard to this issue. But he also conveyed his belief that, in the words of Derek Box, the healthy trends protecting the integrity of science will ultimately prevail. It is not clear to me in what such an optimism is founded. The knowledge economy largely depends on the economy at large, but it does have its own dynamics. And there is certainly an epistemic surplus in the knowledge economy. But whether it is large and strong enough to resist the tendencies just described is at least for me an entirely open question. When addressing such issues, it is helpful to look at not only at what Yehuda wrote, but also to remember what he did and how he acted, precisely in the sense of Gideon Freudenthal's political philosophical analysis. As a science politician, Yehuda was a true leader. And if he contributed to the pluralization of science, and he certainly did, it was not in spite, but because of the decisionism with which he acted as a science politician, ready to take responsibility and always convinced he knew what the true quality is in a given situation, often also against the supposedly objective standards or the judgment of the so-called experts, in particular when they came in the form of a committee. Hence, if we want to successfully construct niches, that is a lesson to learn from him. Resist as much as possible all tendencies turning globalized science into a flatland, governed by a self-construed meritocracy. That also entails critically reflecting on certain forms of benchmarking and global standards that risk to endanger precisely those niches. Yehuda warned indeed against the equalizing and mainstreaming effects of funding policies, and in a joint declaration, we once asked for opening windows of opportunity for unconventional endeavors. Evidently, such appeals will hardly change the academic system. But if this is so, which are then the potential driving forces of the changes that Yehuda deemed necessary? Who are the social carriers of the new enlightenment that he envisaged? This question brings me to another aspect of his science policy, including the curriculum proposal that needs to be re-examined. Its strong and almost exclusive emphasis on the academic elites themselves. Remarkably, this focus on the elites is a feature that Yehuda shared also with other great historians and philosophers of science who took a revolutionary stance with regard to the traditional image of science, but reserved a key role to the academic elites. Think, for instance, of Thomas Kuhn and the pivotal role of the scientific community in his conception of science. 
These academic elites are, however, as I have argued in the beginning, largely entangled in the meritocratic logic reflecting the economic and political boundary conditions of the academic system. As I have also argued, it is hard to see how any major reform in Yehuda's direction might result from this logic alone, even including its shortcomings, its contradictions, and its niches. Just reacting to a crisis of the university will hardly result in a new enlightenment. On the contrary, it might even happen that Yehuda's subversive proposals, and I was very happy that Gabi used the same word subversive, I felt in resonance with that, that Yehuda's subversive proposals will just be assimilated to the increasing demands for the fluidity of thinking even within the prevailing economic logic, as may be illustrated by the hiring of humanists in large enterprises where they serve as advisors, fostering creativity and flexibility among managers, employees, em employers, employees, and clients. How can we then preserve Yehuda's radical and emancipatory vision of a new enlightenment? To avoid stripping off the subversive element from Yehuda's curriculum idea, it would have to be connected to truly subversive themes. It's not just a question of educating concerned citizens, but concerned about what, with what. And to avoid limiting the discursive framework to that of an academic elite, these themes should be connected to a more broadly felt need for a transformation also of the academic world in the direction that Yehuda anticipated, that is, making it not just more interdisciplinary and reflective, but also more just, more critical, and more aware of its own context. In other words, I would expect such a development being fostered not by an academic crisis, but by concerns of the civil society more broadly. This would then also set the curriculum issue into a much wider context of the economy of knowledge, including new educational structures beyond the academic domain, as well as broad cultural and political discourses. Unfortunately, this will probably only happen under a sense of urgency, and when pressing general political, social, or environmental problems are widely perceived also as problems of knowledge. It is under such circumstances that rethinking knowledge and its practices, including a reform of a curriculum, might perhaps be conceived as part of the answer, rather than just as a luxurious embellishment of the prevailing curriculum. This is a perspective going beyond that which Yehuda had evidently developed in the 1960s and 1970s under the impression of discussions about the limits of a reductionist understanding of science pointing to a complex world of many scales, such as Phil Anderson's 1972 essay, More is Different, and the possibility to involve the history and philosophy of science as an ally against such reductionism. But the new enlightenment, which Yehuda rightly demanded, will not just take place because it has somehow always been a messy place, misrepresented by a reductionist science, but because we urgently need to understand the mess that we have produced ourselves in order to cope with it. A curriculum reform therefore has to start not from an institutionalized complementarity of realistic and relativist positions that may appear as just another sophisticated pedagogical trick, but from challenging objects that by themselves deeply and seriously necessitate precisely this kind of complementarity for the sake of the survival of humanity. A key example, perhaps the key example, is that challenging object most central to our survival, our own planet in the state into which we have brought it. This state may be characterized in a way that corresponds to the introduction of a new image of knowledge, namely the Anthropocene. The concept of the Anthropocene has actually been introduced in a geological context, in a very specific geological context as a first order concept, as Yehuda would have put it, serving to denote the geological era shaped by the global impact of human interventions on this planet. But the concept of the Anthropocene has gradually mutated into a second order concept, demanding a new understanding and a reorganization of a broad range of knowledge, thus illustrating precisely the process I have sketched above, 
as being characteristic for seriously challenging objects. And now let me turn a little bit uh, to an explanation of the concept of Anthropocene, which may not be familiar to all of you. It has been introduced at the beginning of the millennium by the Nobel Prize winner, Paul Crutzen, who is the discoverer of the ozone hole and has also made concrete proposal on how to solve this problem. And he noticed that, the, that we have entered a new geological age following the Holocene and its stable parameters, and that is characterized by the global lasting impact of human interventions on this uh, planet. So just to give it a little bit of a more concrete color, 77% of the Earth's surface that is not covered by ice is no longer in its original state. More than 50% of the existing drinking water reserves is being used or regulated by humans. The loss of biodiversity is 100 or 1,000 times larger than without human interventions. The biomass of humans and the animals domesticated by them amounts to 90% of the biomass of all living mammals. We are measuring the highest atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide and methane since at least 800,000 years. On average, every third nitrogen atom in the bi biosphere has been once processed by the fertilizer industry. Humanity is moving more sediments than all natural processes taken together. On average, in the last 130 years, humans have constructed a dam every day. In the Mediterranean Sea, two plankton creatures correspond to one particle of microplastics. So I give you some images of the Anthropocene. I'm sorry? We could just go outside, yeah. That is also true. And it, typically, the Anthropocene is marked by, uh, by this kind of hockey, uh, how do you call them, uh, hockey uh, stick? Hockey stick, huh? hockey, stick curves. hockey stick curves. Yeah, this is the typical one that you always see about the carbon dioxide. But it's just an example of many more such curves, which uh, denote the, the, uh, the consumption of primary energy, uh, the use of per fertilizers, even the production of paper. Uh, Many, many the increase of transport. So that is really uh, what the Anthropocene, uh, what the Anthropocene is, is about. Understanding the Anthropocene has thus challenged the traditional division of the natural sciences, the social sciences, and the humanities. It has made it necessary to rethink basic concepts of the natural sciences, of the social sciences, as well as of the humanities. In particular, the distinction between ecological and economic dimensions, the co-evolutionary dynamics of technological, of the co-evolutionary dynamics of technological developments and environmental changes, and more generally, the relation between biological and cultural evolution. In short, it is a perfect illustration of what Yehuda had in mind when he called for rethinking much of our knowledge from an evolutionary point of view. The point is, however, that the challenges of the Anthropocene are not confined to the academic world and that they are more than just another example of messiness that we might just as well ignore. Rather, these challenges may be perceived not just as political problems, but as challenges to the prevailing cultures and economies of knowledge that do not just concern an academic elite. It may be from such challenges that Yehuda's new enlightenment can draw its resources but only when it is itself considered as being not primarily a task for a self-critical elite, again, a resonance with what Gabi just said, but ultimately as the concern of all citizens of the Anthropocene. The concept of the Anthropocene challenges us to reformulate connections between ecological and social challenges on a global scale, while simultaneously promoting a pivotal new conceptualizations of humankind's positions in a planetary System And here I would like to comment to Helga, we don't need to necessarily look outside for the second Earth and the uh, inhabitants of this Earth. We can also then, from such an imagined perspective, look back at our own planet. And I think, you know, the film that many of you have seen, Interstellar, devised by Kip Thorne, is a wonderful illustration that maybe the solution is not to go out there, but the solution is to look imagine, imaginatively back from out there to our own planet and see it as a closed uh, uh, planetary system with its own planetary boundaries, many of which have meanwhile been transgressed. 
Within this new transdisciplinary continuity, the Anthropocene itself remains a concept in flux, as Yehuda would have said, with its diverse theoretical and practical implications for society, the sciences, the humanities, and the arts, but above all for their common denominator, education and culture. As complex as it is urgent, the challenge of the Anthropocene calls for a special, sustainable, and devoted commitment fostering innovative alliances between academic, civic, and cultural institutions in exploring new ways of education. This challenge has been taken up by the Anthropocene Curriculum, a joint project with the Haus der Kulturen der Welt and the Max Planck Institute for whatever, uh, in, initially, still, initially still in cooperation with Yehuda himself. Drawing on the fundamental change in perspective associated uh, with the Anthropocene, this model project explores the altered conditions and creative possibilities for the current and future generation of knowledge. It is, in the sense of Yehuda, self-reflective and problem-driven through and through. The project for developing this uh, Anthropocene curriculum has emerged during two years of the Anthropocene project also a joint project, but in this case also with the Deutsches Museum, the Rachel Carson Center for Environment and Society, and the Institute for Advanced Sustainability uh, Studies. And in November 2014, we have organized a nine-day Anthropocene campus in combination with the summer school. 130 selected researchers participated, researchers and artists, I should say, from 23 countries, and they took the chance of combining their own course program based on nine different seminars. The participants were able to explore new approaches and forms of knowledge transfer and take part in developing these for their potential future use in their own teaching at universities, schools, but also in the context of private initiatives and NGOs. In terms of content and format, the seminars were created by an international group of 27 scholars, including representatives of the geo, life, and social sciences, as well as uh, the humanities, architecture, art, and design. The group was divided into instructor teams. Each team had a shared thematic interest combined with a great methodological and disciplinary diversity. To prepare for the campus, an online communication platform was, de was developed serving the individual seminars with materials for reading and discussion and eventually for opening it up to a wider community. I'm sure Manfred Laubechler will later say a few more words to it. And when I hear about the digital world and its challenges, I always have to underline, we as, a, as an intellectual community can only take them up if we also emphasize the need for open access to the resources of science and the humanities and engaging ourselves towards the development of a web that is optimized for the production and dissemination of knowledge, an epistemic web, as I would say. Based on close cooperation between a research institute and an international, internationally renowned cultural institution, the Anthropocene campus thus created a new research format as a teaching format and initiated a productive process of reflection on the knowledge underpinning the concept of the Anthropocene, its causes and effects. And I can only uh, tell you that the resonance to this initiative was overwhelming, not just from within the scholarly community. And we will hear more about it tomorrow at the workshop. And then I thank you for your attention.